Hello, good evening and welcome. My name is Amir El Safar. I am a trumpet player, santur player, vocalist, and composer working at the intersections between jazz, Western classical music, and the maqam music of Iraq and the Middle East. I am joining you today from my Brooklyn home studio. Um, thanks to the Knox College Jerome Mirza Virtual Jazz Residency. Um, normally, I would be coming to Illinois and addressing the students and members of the public uh, in a public lecture at some in a, in a lecture hall and giving workshops and private lessons and working with musicians of the jazz and uh, other parts of the music program. Um, sadly, the pandemic has not allowed these types of programs to move forward. Um, we're going on almost 10 months now of no live performances or um, congregating in the way that musicians have been for centuries. Um, it's sort of a, a new era that we're in. But thanks to the wonders of modern technology and a little bit of inventiveness and adaptation, and thanks to Andy Crawford um, at Knox College, and the members of the jazz studies program there for making this lecture series possible. Um, it's my great pleasure to be here uh, speaking to you this evening about my work. And um, as most of you know, I'll be available afterward for a question answer session, which will be held live. Um, so just a little bit about this lecture. Um, we're calling it Beyond the Other Shore, Transcultural Notions in Music. So what do we mean by transcultural and what is, what's transcultural music about? Um, just a brief definition, it has to do with musicians from different cultures or different parts of the world coming together to make a new form of music that somehow synthesizes elements from musical traditions that are not considered to be connected or related to one another. So in my case, a lot of my own musical journey has been about bridging the jazz uh, improvised musical tradition with maqam music from Iraq, from the Arab world, from Turkey, from Iran, and from the larger Middle East and Central Asia. So joining musical uh, traditions and finding ways of, of connection, cross-pollinization, interconnectedness through music is what transcultural music is about. Just a little bit about myself. I was born in 1977 to an Iraqi immigrant father and an American mother. Um, we, I grew up in a suburb of Chicago called Oak Park, which some of you may be familiar with. It's famous for um, Frank Lloyd Wright houses, and it's also the birth town of, of uh, Ernest Hemingway. Um, and there was a lot of uh, pride in Oak Park uh, about this uh, legacy. Um, but for me, it was important. Um, it, it played an important part of my life being uh, next to Chicago and being connected with musical scenes in Chicago. Um, the first music I heard when I was very young was the music of Louis Armstrong, uh, who my father was very fond of. I think I could even name the record. It was Porgy and Bess, uh, Louis Armstrong with Ella Fitzgerald. That was the first sound that entered my my ears as a, as a very young child. Um, I was also obsessed with the music of the Blues Brothers at the age of two. Um, I had learned how to use a turntable and uh, used to play the record nonstop um, of, of uh, all those songs that, that were actually recorded right around the time I was born in Chicago. Um, and I think that those musical influences um, would play an important part in my musical development uh, for the rest of my life. Um, my first musical training was in Lutheran church choirs. Um, I went to Grace Lutheran Church in River Forest and was very fortunate to be part of a music program there that included, um, uh, there was a church organist, there was choral singing. Um, we were singing not only the very traditional hymns, but also uh, cantatas of Bach and uh, other important works. Um, I, I was exposed to that from a very young age and didn't quite realize how much it was, how lucky I was uh, to be learning how to sing in harmony and uh, with multiple layers um, at 
starting at the age of five or six. Um, but my first real musical love was the Beatles. Um, when I was about age nine or 10, I discovered the Beatles and um, began playing the guitar. And I was determined to learn every single Beatles song. I don't know if I got all the way there, but I did learn most of them. And learning the music of the Beatles was kind of my training in uh, harmony and in understanding chords and how chords and melody fit together and um, why a D7 chord led to a G major, how G major and C major were connected, etc. cetera. Um, I formed my own understanding of it through learning these songs um, and much later would learn what the theoretical underpinnings were. Um, so through listening to the Beatles, I later discovered the Rolling Stones and discovered popular music of um, America and Great Britain from the 1960s and 70s. Um, but that eventually led me to the blues. Um, so around the age of 12 or 13, I was listening to Muddy Waters and Robert Johnson. Um, and then a few steps later, I got into jazz. Um, by the age of uh, 14, I think I heard Miles Davis kind of blue for the first time. And I assume that many of you are familiar with that album. If you're not, uh, I recommend that you go out and buy it or download it right away. It's one of the most important records um, in the history of jazz and the history of music. And it's uh, two notable things about it. One is that it focused on modes as opposed to harmony. So the the seven Greek modes as they're known, I actually refer to them as Babylonian modes because they date back to ancient Babylon. Um, but this kind of improvisational approach uh, later became very important in jazz and actually is very much connected to Arabic music and Iraqi and, and Middle Eastern music in general, uh, which I'll get to a little bit later. Um, and the other important element of this uh, of this record was that it was a completely improvised session. Um, Miles showed up that day with the music and the players were uh, dealing with it for the first time. And so what that album captured was the moment of discovery, was the moment of, of, of a new sound emerging that had never existed before. It wasn't capturing something that had been pre-composed or pre-worked out. And that's something very important. And it's something that I, uh, strive for in my own music, in particular my own recordings. And again, I'm going to talk about this a little bit more um, as we get further on the lecture. Um, back to my personal story. Um, so I was nine in school bands and orchestras, but was never very interested in it um, because probably the way it was being taught, frankly, was not very interesting. Um, the music was was nothing that I was interested in hearing. It wasn't anything I could relate to. Um, I think the band directors were fine, but they there was nothing motivating for me, nothing that I felt um, that I really wanted to play. I was always driven by music that, that I loved, like the Beatles, like the Rolling Stones, like the Blues, and then Miles Davis. Um, around the time I, I discovered Miles, I also started getting into playing classical music on the trumpet. Uh, thanks to a, a young trumpet player at high school. Um, he was about four years older than I was uh, playing the Haydn trumpet concerto, Franz Joseph Haydn, who's one of the most important composers in the Western European canon, uh, in particular in, in the classical era. And when I heard this piece, I suddenly wanted to learn to play, uh, to play this concerto and, and later to become a classical trumpet player. So I spent my high school and college years playing jazz and classical trumpet, always in, in tandem. And um, obviously the main uh, example uh, was Wynton Marsalis of somebody who was able to do that successfully, but there wasn't, there weren't too many people at, at that time. It was really, we were supposed to make a choice. Are you jazz musician? Or are you a classical musician? Well, I was, was kind of existing between the two. Um, and in my college years, I played in the, I went to DePaul University. I played in the orchestras and wind ensembles and jazz ensembles at DePaul. Um, but I also started to gig around Chicago uh, thanks to a phone call I received um, from Brad Good, a uh, trumpet player who now lives in, in Colorado. Um, he asked me if I'd be willing to sub for him with the Barrett Deems big band. Barrett Deems was a drummer. 
uh, who at the time was 83 years old. He had been Louis Armstrong's drummer uh, throughout the 1950s and was full of stories and uh, lots of things that probably nobody else would, would have wanted uh, to get out that, that he knew uh, from having played uh, with Louis back in the day. And um, you might, if you've ever seen the movie High Society, uh, he's featured in that film and they even give him a solo. And um, so I was immediately as, as an 18 year old playing on stage with this uh, incredible drummer. And again, not realizing how lucky I was to be connected with this lineage of, you know, the beginnings of jazz. Um, and from there, I started to play in all over Chicago with different uh, bands, everything from jazz big bands to small combos to blues bands, rhythm and blues bands, wedding bands, bar mitzvah bands, Greek band, weddings, everything. I was doing uh, any I had a little pager at the time. Uh, those are obsolete now, um, predecessor to the cell phone. And, you know, the pager would go off, I'd get to a payphone, put 35 cents in and call. And, you know, sometimes people would ask me if I could come to a gig in three hours and I would show up. Um, I was just willing to do any and every uh, musical type of gig possible. Um, I was also playing in the Civic Orchestra of Chicago. And I found uh, working in the Civic Orchestra with Bud Herseth, uh, Dale Clevenger, Jay Friedman, these legends of the Chicago brass uh, cadre of the 20th century, um, and also working under conductors like Pierre Boulez, uh, Daniel Barenboim, and uh, Mr. Slav Ostropovich and others. Um, so this was my training in music. Um, and around the age of 21, 22, I decided to move to New York. And that was a big change. I was, I think I was quite comfortable in Chicago and probably could have um, stayed there for many years, gigging in various contexts. But I was really determined to find my own voice, to find my own sound. I didn't want to be just playing bebop or playing, you know, swing bands and playing anything that. I was asked to do. I, I really felt like there was something inside that needed to be discovered. Um, so while in New York, my first couple of years, I started to find in this vast and sprawling scene that they called the jazz scene or improvised music scene, many, many different types of music and different influences. And uh, in particular, I was drawn to the jazz that was connecting with non-Western music. And that was when I realized there was something absent in all of my musical training. And you might be asking yourself uh, or noticing what that absent uh, musical training was, and that was Arabic music, Iraqi music. Um, you know, my father's from Iraq, and yet I had really no connection. Uh, I didn't speak the language, I didn't know much about the culture, and I certainly knew nothing about the music. So I um, won a jazz competition, the, the, the uh, Carmine Caruso competition in the year 2001. And in 2002, I went on a journey uh, to the Middle East and first went to Iraq and then traveled around uh, to Syria, Lebanon, um, Egypt, Tunisia, Morocco, trying to discover um, as much um, as many different musical forms as I could. In particular, the one that really spoke to me was the Maqam al Iraqi or the Iraqi Maqam. Um, and I was very lucky to find a teacher who really imparted um, so much of this tradition to me. I'm actually gonna play you an example of Iraqi maqam before I start to describe what it means uh, and, and what it consists of technically. So this is a performance from 2019 uh, with my teacher Hamid Asadi and I'm playing the Sun Tour.
So there you have an example of maqam singing and santur, which is the instrument I'm playing there. You can also see the santur behind me. Uh, I'll give a demonstration of it um, later on in my uh, in in the question answer session. Um, but basically, the maqam there's two definitions musically speaking. One is a broad definition of a musical system of modes that are used throughout the entire Middle East. I should say as far as far west as North Africa, the western part of North Africa. So Morocco. Uh, Tunisia, Libya, Egypt, the entire um, Persian Gulf, the, the Arabian Peninsula, um, the Arab world, um, Iraq, uh, historical Palestine, modern day Israel, um, Lebanon, Syria, Turkey as well, then into Central Asia, Iran, Uzbekistan, Kyrgyzstan, etc., all the way to Western China. So we're talking about a very large part of the world, including as well some influences found in Eastern European music, Southern European, like Southern Italian music um, and, and uh, Southern Spain as well, the flamenco, that have influences of maqam. And basically it's a system of modes. Um, now modes are, for those of you that our musicians, you're probably familiar already. There's there's kind of seven main modes that are uh, come from Greece, but like, as I mentioned earlier, were originally um, discovered or created in Babylon and maybe much earlier. Um, and they're basic. This is, they, they form the basis of Western European music, but they also form the basis of um, maqam music. And so these modes, I'll give an example. So Ionian would be that's basically the major scale. Dorian and Phrygian and etc. So you basically have the same notes, but depending on where the tonic is, the 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 quality of the mode changes now in um maqam music you use those basic same modes but there's also another quality of sound or another interval that's used called then these we refer to as microtones or quarter tones so instead of major or minor or major or minor we have something that's in between that third degree and the seventh degree are quarter tones. They're not found on the keyboard or the piano. Uh, they exist between the white notes and the black notes. And they have very distinct quality to them and a distinctive emotional, um, they create a distinct emotional response. And um, through learning to sing them and learning to play them, in my experience, I started, my ears became much more attuned to the subtleties of sound and to the, the vibrations that are kind of the, the, the notes in between the notes. And maqam music uses these, and there's all kinds of, I mean, we call them E half flat, B half flat, as if there's a 50 cents in between the, the 100 cents of a, of a semitone. So, you know, but it's not exactly halfway between the B and the B flat. It's sometimes a little bit higher, depend, sometimes a little bit lower depending on the region, depending on the quality of the song that's being sung or, or played. And these subtle gradations are where all the magic is in maqam. Um, so maqam music really thrives on, on and, and is, is, is based on these very subtle tunings. Um, but what maqam music doesn't include is harmony in the sense of chords. So um, Western music is built on major triads, minor triads, seventh chords, 
ninth chords and, and all kinds of extensions that you encounter um, from Bach, well, pre, 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 before Bach, I mean, from the medieval music through the Renaissance to the, the present day, um, that at, at least starting with Bach were based on um, equal temperament, where every, every interval, uh, the, the intervals are all the same, A to B flat, B flat to B, B to C, etc. Um, whereas in Maqam music, these intervals are, are malleable, they're not fixed, but uh, we don't have chords or, or sort of a harmonic system around it. So um, in Iraq, so that's a general sense of what Maqam, how Maqam is used through this large region that I uh, described earlier. In Iraq in particular, Maqam is a repertoire of melodies that are then brought together to create longer songs. And these are kind of a bit complex because the melodies themselves are not always set. They're not always sung exactly the same way. Um, there's room for improvisation. They're rhythmically free. So, so everybody is expected to interpret them slightly differently, but, um, but there's a sort of core essence that always stays the same. So um, through working these melodies and then combining them with other melodies, longer compositions that are, you know, could last anywhere from 10 to 15 minutes or longer um, are created that are kind of more, um, if you've ever heard a call to prayer or if you've ever heard Quranic recita recitation or even a, a Jewish liturgical, um, like a, a cantor reciting the Torah, it's this style of, of, of singing or incantation where the, the vowels are, are sung in these long melismas that that carry on. So what, what you heard Hamid singing is an example um, of, of what a maqam would sound like in Iraq um, and to some extent in, in the region in general. So as I mentioned, around the year 2002, I was studying maqam and started in Iraq and then uh, early 2003 was when the US invasion uh, and the sort of second Gulf War began. Um, I left the country, I left Iraq just before that and spent some time traveling around the Middle East looking for teachers of this maqam tradition. Eventually ended up in, in London and Amsterdam and Munich uh, where I found some expatriate, or I should rather say a refugee, uh, Iraqi musicians that were um, still performing this music and were able to teach it to me. So um, I spent what I planned on being about three months, but ended up being five or six years of my life um, studying this music and going very, very deep uh, to the point that I basically learned the entire repertoire through singing and also playing the santur. Um, and around the year uh, 2005, I received my first commission. And that was from an organization in Philadelphia called the Painted Bride um, Theater and, and uh, Arts Organization. And the director, Lenny Seidman, asked me if I could compose a piece combining jazz and maqam. Now, that was what I had set out to do um, five, six years earlier when I started studying maqam. My whole purpose was to study, was to eventually combine it with jazz. However, after spending five years of deep, deep dive in Iraqi maqam, I didn't want to do anything but just sing and play maqam in its pure form. And I spent months and months agonizing over how to combine these two seemingly very, very different musical traditions. And now this might not seem like such a big deal, especially today, there's a lot of Arabic jazz fusions out there. Um, in addition to Indian jazz fusions, in addition to African jazz, there's, there's so much. Um, but first of all, in the year, in 2006, there was, wasn't quite as much uh, of this kind of fusion going on. And secondly, I was approaching it from somebody who had spent years deeply steeped in the jazz tradition and then spent years steeped in the maqam tradition. And both of these musical languages were becoming second nature to me. And I, I really didn't feel like, I didn't feel comfortable combining them because they seem so 
beautiful and pure on their own. So at some point in my compositional process, I threw my hands up in the air and I said, you know what, I'm going to take my band on stage. We're going to do one set of traditional maqam music and then one set of jazz and the messages that these are two different styles of music and they shouldn't be combined. And then I thought about it for a while. I said, no, maybe it's not really fair to, to the, the project. So how about looking for ways to connect? And little by little, as I started to meditate on these maqams, I started to find these points of commonality because um, I really didn't want to do it in a superficial way. Like, you know, just add an exotic instrument and, you know, an, an oud and a drum set and boom, you, you got something, you know, it, it, it needed to be meaningful. Um, so I started to discover inside of the maqams certain modes that actually were similar to certain harmonies that exist in jazz. Um, so like one mode, uh, this is called saba. <laughs> I discovered that that had something in common with uh, with the sharp nine chord, which is a very common chord found in, in jazz, blues, and, and other forms of popular music in, in the U.S. And so I wrote my first piece combining this mode with sort of a, a slow backbeat feel, funk feel that was w what I felt like was the equivalent in in the jazz feeling. and, and Again, I think the common the common um, denominator was the blues, um, because blues is something that I feel is a strong part of maqam singing, and it's also deeply it is the source of not only jazz music but let's face it, all popular music uh, in in the United States um, is 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 deeply connected with the blues, so or derived from the blues, I should say. So. Um, I'm going to play you an example of uh, my Two Rivers Ensemble, and then I'm going to talk more about it. This is not the first piece that I composed for Two Rivers. Actually, this is, was about six years later. Um, in the year 2013, I was commissioned to write something for the Newport Jazz Festival. So I'm going to show that video to you. I hate to cut that short, but we're limited on time here. Uh, I do encourage you to check that out. Uh, if you want to see the whole video, uh, you can find it on YouTube, obviously. Uh, Two Rivers, live at Newport. That was our debut, uh, Newport Jazz Festival debut, and the premiere of a piece called Crisis that came out a couple of years later on Pi Recordings. Um, so what you see is um, trumpet, saxophone, bass, and drums, those are instruments that are typical in a jazz context. Um, and then two other instruments, the buzuk, which is uh, this long necked lute, and the oud, which is the shorter necked lute, which then gets the um, zafir, the oud player, switches to a, a tabla, which is percussion instrument. And so 
obviously the instrumentation is combining these two different traditions. And I also play Santur and sing um, in, in that group. So, and if, if you check out more of the material, you can you can hear how, how that works and how they fit together. Um, but basically all of the pieces in Two Rivers are taking some element of the maqam, some melody, some theme, some sensibility, and then combining it with, with a way in, of improvisation or a certain texture or a certain a certain uh, ensemble uh, technique from jazz. So you know a lot of kind of sounding free improvisation, but it's always kept in in balance. And so I'm I, the goal with Two Rivers, which is a real challenge, is how can we let these two musical forms coexist and really um stay in a balance and and of course there's moments when it's much more sounding like traditional arabic music there's other moments where it feels more like um jazz but there's this kind of very delicate and 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 malleable balance between the two and it's really taken years for that to to work out two rivers has now been playing together for for 15 years um, march 25th 2021 will be our 15 year anniversary and we were supposed to do a concert then uh, maybe we'll do something online so please stay and uh, keep po posted for that um, but in any case uh, so that's the two rivers ensemble that's the idea of it um, I'm going to now show you an example of what came next. So Two Rivers uh, has released three albums, and we've been touring all over the world um, over these past decade and a half. In the year 2015, I received a commission to compose for a much larger group called Rivers of Sound, 17 musicians. So we have the six-piece Two Rivers Ensemble, and then the addition of 11 more musicians that kind of You'll, you'll hear um, the palette is much wider. I'll, I'll, I'm going to play you a musical example and then we can, um, we can talk about it afterward. Again, sorry to cut it short, but it's on YouTube. You can find it if you want to listen to the whole thing. Um, that was Two Rivers playing at Symphony Center Orchestra Hall in Chicago, which many of you might be familiar with that stage. Um, that was where I had trained in my college days uh, with the Civic Orchestra of Chicago under Boulez and Baron Boim and others. Um, so that was a very important show for me. That was kind of a homecoming concert. Um, but Rivers of Sound, basically, we have this Two Rivers concept, the, the Arabic music, jazz, combining, interpenetrating, interpenetrating. But now we have this wider soundscape. So you see a vibraphone, uh, piano, guitar, uh, cello, violin, English horn, two saxophones. We have two ouds now instead of one. So we en I, I ended up with a much wider palette to compose, uh, compose for. 
And the other thing is it became more than just combining jazz and Arabic music. It actually became much more about each person's musical sensibilities and what they bring to the overall sound. So, so yes, you see people coming from the Arab world, you see people coming from jazz tradition, classical music. There's also an Indian Murdangam player, but I was less concerned with what people's, you know, background or identity was, what their musical orientation and more what their personality is and, and what they bring, um, what sensibilities they bring to the sound. So in, in some sense, I was composing for that group, but I left a lot of open spaces so that they could also contribute. So oftentimes the idea is, you know, you have a composer, they write out the whole score, and then maybe there's an improvised section, which, you know, a soloist can then be free and they do whatever they want. And then we're back to the composed music. Well, in Rivers of Sound, that dichotomy doesn't exist quite as much. It's, it's this idea that the composition is part of the improvisation. The improvisation is part of the composition. There's, it's very fluid. And so while I might have, you know, written out um, some melodies, maybe somebody else, you know, someone in the band will interpret it one way. Someone else will listen and respond another way. There's, a, there's kind of a, a conversation going on. And in that way, we end up with more than just a fusion of, of musical forms. We end up with, with a, a real uh, coagulation or, or combination of, of sounds coalescing in this organic way. And Rivers of Sound was something that I had dreamed about for years. And when it finally came together in 2015, there was so much magic and so much more than what I ever could have dreamed of because it was everybody's contribution. And you know, when they say the whole is greater than the sum of its parts, it's somehow something magical um, and, and really beyond the imagination, uh, at least beyond my imagination that occurred when, when Rivers of Sound first came together. And we've been performing ever since. We have another album uh, that so we recorded in 2015, uh, an album called Not Two, it came out in 2017. And then uh, last year we recorded our second album, uh, which will come out in uh, in June, and we'll uh, hopefully keep you posted about that as well. Um, so basically, we just have a few more minutes, and I've talked about kind of my orientation, being a jazz and classical trained musician, discovering the music of the Arab world, the Iraqi maqam, etc., and kind of bringing these worlds together. Now, for a long time, I believed that in order to do a successful musical combining of elements, you needed to be fully grounded in each tradition to, to, to make it work. Um, and then in, in 2015, I received my first commission to do something really outside of my musical world. And that was from the director of the Royaumont Foundation in France. His name was Frédéric Deval. Uh, Sadly, he died um, after commissioning me and never got to hear the final piece. Um, but I did go on a, a two-year mission, traveling to Spain every few months and studying, uh, learning about flamenco. I didn't ever try to learn to play or sing flamenco, but I tried to surround myself with it and understand flamenco in its own context. Um, Frederic, his commission to me was to come up with a microtonal approach for flamenco and basically to take the guitar out and to come up with another imagined way of, 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 of dealing with the harmony. So that was an interesting challenge. And for me, being someone who's not based, not a flamenco musician, uh, it was a bit daunting. But um, I think we came up with something interesting. And I'm going to, again, I'm going to play just a, a sample for you. And then we'll, we'll talk about what what went into this project.
again, sorry to cut it short. Unfortunately, you can't find that one online yet. That's a private link, but it will be available at some point, uh, hopefully very soon. That project is called uh, Luminescencia, Luminescence. And it's all about light and it's all about um, finding beauty in the duende or the, the deep pathos and emotion of flamenco and tarab, T-A-R-A-B, which is the ecstatic expression of maqam. And again, for me, also this blues um, uh, element that to me, there's something very, very common in, the, in, in these different expressions. And what I mean is that the musical language can change, the note names can change, the modes change. This is harmony, this is this particular mode, this particular scale, microtones, etc. But what I was interested in finding was that core emotional intensity, um, that, that ecstasy, that expression that goes deeper than any musical language. And so when working with something like flamenco, where I didn't really have a, a, a deep grounding in the, in the, you know, I, I it would need another 20 years before I could learn to master that, that, that language. Um, but by spending time in the taverns and spending time in the festivals and surrounding myself with that music, I started to get an understanding of it on an emotional and, and visceral level. And that was what I went for with the Luminescencia project. Um, I'm going to play you another example of another musical style that was outside of my purview, outside of my, my, my world. Um, but it was another commissioned piece, which was to work with trance musical traditions from Africa. So I was working with the Dream City Festival in Tunisia, and they asked me to do something connecting to Tunisian music. And I found a style called Stambeli, which is very similar to Gnawa, if any of you know that music from Morocco. Um, and it's it's a trance music that basically is repetitive melodies that that one goes deeper and deeper into and and actually goes into real trance. And I had a chance to witness some ceremonies, some healing ceremonies where people went very far, um, but it was it was quite normal for them to to have these experiences. Um, so for this project, uh, I spent a lot of time in Tunis in the years uh, 2018, 19, um, but also went to Morocco. I went to Mali. I went to southern parts of Tunisia, sort of more Saharan parts of Tunisia, um, where I found musicians who worked with this basically same musical language that has different manifestations. And what we came up with was a project that later we called Trance. And here's just a little trailer of the trance project. And there you have it. Um, so this is another example of a musical form that I was not deeply immersed in. I'm certainly not a master of, and, and again, it's it's a lifetime. Uh, any musical form that you wanna truly, truly uh, embrace is a lifetime of work. And I feel like, you know, I, I've had two life or three lifetimes packed into my short 43 years on this planet. Um, but they're very much part of who I am, the jazz music, the classical music, and the maqam. And so in my experience, combining these is the natural thing to do. It's the, it's the kind of my only choice if I want to be genuine and true to myself as a musician. Um, but when I was asked to do things outside of that, outside of my musical comfort zones, 
I didn't really want to try to just, you know, combine combine you know like write something for a flamenco singer to sing this and i would i actually am much more interested in allowing each person to express what they are and then all i do is organize the sound and organize the the overall context but without being the 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 director i don't i don't like being too much in control and i think that the more interesting things emerge when you let them happen rather than trying to make them happen so um Anyway, we're getting very close to the end. I think it's almost 45 minutes. Maybe I've gone over by a little bit. So I, in these musical examples, um, you can hear and see this combination of different cultures emerging and, and what's often referred to as musical fusions um, or musical synthesis. And I find that this is my personal way of doing things. Um, I don't know that it's the way for everybody. I think each person has to find their own musical path. And, um, you know, if I were to give any advice or any sort of guidance to younger people, it's always to listen inward to, to what drives them. Yes, you know, when you're young, you have to learn your scales, you have to learn a certain repertoire, there's a certain, and I think don't gloss over that, because that's, that's your toolkit. But listen for the thing that really drives you that that really attracts you what's the sound that that mo motivates you is it what everyone says you're supposed to listen for or is there something else you know is it something in the rhythm that 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 speaks to you every time you hear it what what gets you excited that's in that question what moves me what gets me excited lies the answer to what is my voice who am i as a musician what do i have to contribute um, so for many years, there were little things like when I first heard kind of blue and it was this modes that were so beautiful, Dorian mode, you know, it was the simplest thing in the world and yet so powerful and, and so rich and, and, and it spoke to me on so many levels. Well, that ended up being very close to the maqam music that I would start, start to study more than a decade later. Um, and similarly, certain things in Thelonious Monk's music that, that you know, certain chords that he played, that when I worked with Cecil Taylor years later, I also heard it once again, but understood them differently. And those became part of my musical sound, my identity, my, my palette of things that I work with when, whenever I compose. And whether I'm writing music for a very strict um, Middle Eastern uh, traditional context or for a very open jazz group or writing for symphony orchestras, I always listen to what's the sound that excites me and that, that moves me. So um, when it comes to musical fusions and musical synthesis, well, everything is a musical fusion. If you play one note on the piano and you play a second note on the piano, you've already created a fusion. Why do I say that? Because when you play one note, you're not only playing that let's say it's C or Do, you're playing the entire overtone series of that note. So in that C, there's another C that's being heard and another a G above that and a C, et cetera, et cetera. All of these overtones to the infinite degree are being sounded with every sound that you make on any instrument. With the trumpet, it's, it's an even more complex um, uh, overtone spectrum. With the clarinet, it's different. When you play one note and then you play another note at the same time, you are now combining these infinite overtone series together to create something that's not that note and not the other note. It's a synthesis. So that's just in playing two notes together or two instruments together. What happens when you bring two improvising musicians together? You have a kind of a fusion, a kind of a synthesis because this person is influenced by John Coltrane and Miles Davis, and that one's influenced by Monk and McCoy Tyner, and they come together and you have something happening. Even one composer, when you, you know, look at Bella Bartok, for instance, he was combining so many different elements that were the music that he grew up with, that he went and studied in his uh, field work and his, in his, um, you know, long journeys around uh, Central and, and Eastern Europe. So everything is a, is a fusion. So there's no, you know, the idea that it's only a fusion when you have, 
you know, the Western and non-Western tradition are two exotic forms coming together is, is a, something that we need to examine because actually everything we do is, is somehow a, a, a new synthesis, a new fusion. Um, and I, I think it's important to think, uh, to realize that in whatever we do. And again, what are the elements that made me who I am as a musician? In my case, it was everything from the Blues Brothers to Lutheran Church to orchestras to Iraqi maqam. That's my experience. And I'm now creating my own um, honest and genuine attempt at an honest and genuine expression of that. So what is your experience, you as a a uh, young musician, um, student at Knox College, or wherever else in the world you are listening, and what is it that makes that 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 draw dr drives you and inspires you in music? What made you play music in the first place? That's where the magic and where the the inspiration and the the, the your personal sound comes from. So um, I'm going to leave it at that, and uh, I thank you all for listening. Again, I thank Andy Crawford and the staff at, at, at Knox College for making this possible. And um, the Jerome Mirza residency has been, is truly a gift to the community and I'm so honored and, and delighted to be a part of it. So um, I look forward to meeting some of you very soon in the question and answer session. Take care.